Aloha Biochem. In this video, we discuss chapter one topic of temperature. So in this lecture, we will finish off the chapter with section 1.9. We've already hit the other sections, including density, so this is the last topic. Now we're all familiar with temperature. We've had our temperature taken, and oftentimes we want to know what the temperature is around us in the air, and also when we cook or chill foods, we're interested in temperature as well. Temperature is a physical property of matter that measures how hot or cold something is. What you need to be able to do is understand the three main temperature scales discussed in the textbook and how to convert temperature values in one of the scales to that of another scale. So if I say, what is the temperature in Celsius if it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit. You should be able to do that conversion. And we'll talk about these conversion equations in just a moment. But first, a little background on the different temperature scales. Your author has a very nice diagram which shows the main differences. So the scales are the Fahrenheit, the Celsius, and the Kelvin. Now the Fahrenheit scale was named after Daniel Great Gabriel Fahrenheit. He's a German physicist. And the way he developed his scale is he set at zero. Zero is not pictured on here, it's down there somewhere, but zero was the coldest temperature he was able to obtain. So he probably didn't live up in the Arctic or Alaska or in the you know, anywhere really cold, zero was the coldest he could get. And the way he got that was by mixing ammonium chloride with water. When he took that salt and he dissolved it in water, uh, it cooled down the water and, and that was the coldest that he could get. So that happens sometimes when you mix salt, different salts with water, it cools down the water. And he set at 100 degrees the temperature of his wife who was uh, standing nearby. So she might have had a slight elevated temperature that day. So the way a thermometer works, you can see a picture of a thermometer, is you fill a thermometer with a certain type of fluid like alcohol or mercury, and fluid expands and contracts as the temperature rises and cools. And so if you fill a glass thermometer with some fluid and you stick that thermometer into the ammonium chloride water mixture, okay, it, it's sitting there at whatever temperature it is, then what you do to create a temperature scale is you make a mark on the thermometer where the liquid level is. So after uh, Daniel Fahrenheit immersed the glass thermometer into the water mixture, uh, then the liquid level moved, and when it stopped, that was where it represented the water mixture, and he drew a line that said, that's zero. And then his wife came over, and, and he asked her not very nicely if he could take her temperature, and uh, probably did it orally, and and so when the liquid level moved again, it, it rose because the liquid expanded. And after it came to a stop, that represented uh, the temperature of his wife. He drew another line and he called that uh, 100. And that created the scale. He could then uh, divide the space between 0 and 100 into 100 equal intervals and then continue on above 100 with equal intervals to get higher temperatures and then below zero to get colder temperatures if he needed to. So that's how you create a temperature scale. Now uh, let's go over to the Celsius thermometer. Celsius was named after Ander Celsius who's a Swedish astronomer. Now 
before 1948, the Celsius scale was actually named centigrade. So perhaps you've heard of centigrade and Celsius. It used to be centigrade, now it's Celsius in honor of Ander Celsius. And the way he created his scale was with a similar glass tube filled with a expandable liquid and at the for freezing water he set that to be zero and for boiling water he set that at 100 and he created his scale after that <clears throat> now notice that the temperatures are quite different in the celsius scale and in the fahrenheit scale if you compare, say, the boiling points of water in the two scales, Celsius boils at 100 degrees, and, and in the Fahrenheit scale, it's 212 degrees. Now go down to the freezing point. Celsius scale, water freezes at zero, but in the Fahrenheit scale, it freezes at 32. Now let's compare the size of a degree. Between the freezing and boiling points of water, there are 100 Celsius degrees. So that tells you something about the size of a Celsius degree. But how many Fahrenheit degrees are there? Between 32 Fahrenheit, which is the freezing temperature in Fahrenheit, and 212, which is the boiling temperature, there are 180 Fahrenheit degrees. So a Fahrenheit degree is actually smaller than a Celsius degree. Okay, so Celsius degree is a little bit larger because it, it only takes 100 of them to go between freezing and boiling, whereas it takes 180 Fahrenheit to go between freezing and boiling. So that's one of the main differences between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Now the Kelvin scale is pretty closely related to the Celsius scale. Uh, the Kelvin scale, the size of a Kelvin degree is the same as the size of a Celsius degree. So water freezes at 273 Kelvin, but it boils at 373 Kelvin. So it takes 100 Kelvin degrees to go between the two temperatures, just like it does in the Celsius scale. Now the Kelvin scale was named after a British physicist, Lord Kelvin, uh, whose real name was William Thompson. He apparently was of nobility and he liked the Celsius scale, but he wanted to start at zero. So the coldest possible temperature, physicists knew that there is a coldest possible temperature that can be achieved, and Kelvin wanted to call that zero, and then just start from there using the same size degree as in the Celsius scale. It's pretty easy to convert back and forth between Celsius and Kelvin, and it's a little more tricky to go between Celsius and Fahrenheit. So that's a little background on the different temperature scales. Let's discuss the conversion equations. If you know the temperature in Celsius and you want to convert that to Fahrenheit, it's a little different process to convert temperatures than it is to convert, say, lengths. You need to know the equations of temperature conversion. And they're not complicated. So the way you do it to go from Celsius to Fahrenheit is to take your Celsius temperature, multiply it by 1.8, and then add 32, and that would give you the number in Fahrenheit. If you wanted to get from Fahrenheit back to Celsius, you subtract 32 and then divide the result by 1.8 and that gets you back to Celsius. To convert Celsius to Kelvin is pretty simple. You just add 273.15 and that gets you Kelvin. And to get back to Celsius, you take your Kelvin temperature and you subtract 273.15. That gets you back to Celsius. Let's see a couple of examples. Suppose the temperature of a British hospital patient is measured at 40 degrees Celsius. Now, 40 degrees Celsius, is, do you think that's hot or cold? Let's go back to that uh, diagram. It's over here. Okay, 
This diagram has normal body temperature listed for all three scales. Now, here in America, we all know that body temperature is 98.6. That's a good body temperature. In the Celsius scale, it's 37 Celsius. So when, whenever you go a little bit above the normal body temperature, if you, you know, are up like 101, 102, that's getting into the fever range. And so when you get a little bit above in Celsius, you're getting up into the fever range as well. So here the problem says the hospital patient is at 40 Celsius. So that's three degrees higher than normal body temperature. And you remember the size of a Celsius degree is actually larger than the size of a Fahrenheit degree. So this hospital patient it looks like he's got some issues. So let's do the conversion. Now to go from Celsius to Fahrenheit, let's look at the equation again. You multiply by 1.8 and then add 32. Okay, so, so let's do that first. It's down here. You take your Celsius, it's 40 degrees Celsius. You multiply by 1.8 and then add 32. So 1.8 times 40 gets you 72. And then when you add 32, that comes to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's definitely a fever. Now, I don't know any hospitals that use Kelvin. Kelvin's more for scientists, but you were asked to do the conversion, so let's do it. To get from Celsius to Kelvin, you simply add 273.15. So 40.0 plus 273.15, that gets you 313.15. And using the sig fig rules of addition, the 40.0 is known to the 10th position and the 273.15 to the 100th. So we're limited to the 10th and that's where we round it. So this would round to 313.2 Kelvin. So if you have a temperature of 313.2 Kelvin, you're in trouble. That's what you need to know how to do in this chapter uh, for temperature. So temperature, there's not too much more to it, but there's something kind of interesting that I wanted to mention before we close up the chapter temperature there's something else about it which is which is rather interesting it's also a measure of the amount of motion of particles that is happening on the atomic and molecular scale okay hot atoms and molecules are moving and vibrating faster than cold atoms and molecules so you may not have uh, heard of this before but when you experience hot and cold. If you touch a hot surface, we know that sense of touch. That, we know what that feels like. It feels hot. Okay, and if you touch something cold, it feels cold. What you don't see, what's going on on the molecular scale, we cannot see atoms and molecules, but what's actually going on is the hot material, like if it's a hot stove and you touch a hot stove, those uh, metal atoms that make up the stove they are, are vibrating around really quickly, okay? When a substance heats up, its atoms and molecules begin moving around more quickly. And as a substance cools down, uh, the vibrational motion slows down, okay? That, that's what's going on behind the scenes. So well, when you touch a hot surface, uh, you, you sense that. That's what that feeling is, okay? And when you touch a cold surface, uh, you can, you know, it feels cold, and that's what that feeling is. It, it's, it's, uh, it's happening. The molecular motion is different than what the molecular motion is in your fingers. So if you imagine, say, a, a cold piece of ice at negative 10 Celsius, these are water molecules that make up the cold ice. Okay, so the particles here are water molecules. Now... This is a solid, so the molecules are locked together. They're not flowing around one another. Okay, and they are vibrating somewhat, you know, uh, 
it doesn't matter if something's cold, it's still, you know, the particles still vibrate around somewhat. When you heat up the cold ice by maybe taking it out of the freezer and you put it in the room, well, it starts to warm up. And what happens is the water molecules begin to vibrate faster and faster. Now, eventually, those water molecules begin to vibrate so fast that they break free from those interactive interaction forces which are holding them locked together. There's some kind of mysterious uh, glue that holds molecules together, okay? And, and that's why there are solid substances and liquid substances because there's something holding the particles close together. But as you heat the substance up, eventually the vibrational motion in the molecules overcomes that sticking force and they begin to slide past one another. Okay, the, the, the interaction force isn't strong enough to keep them locked together anymore. So they begin sliding past one another and then the substance melts into a liquid. Okay, now the interaction force is still there. It kind of keeps the water molecules together in the liquid phase. And if you continue to heat up your liquid, then eventually the vibrational motion in the water molecules is so great that they just completely break free from one another. They, they are, are stronger than the interaction force that holds the molecules together completely and, and then they vaporize into the gas phase. And then if you heat up your gas, the water molecules just fly around that much more quickly. Now, if you have hot steam, and you cool it back down, those water molecules that are whizzing around in the gas phase, you know, as they pass one another, uh, they, they would whiz right by one another. But as you cool down your steam, the speed at which the molecules are traveling in the gas phase slows down. And eventually, once the steam is cold enough, two molecules that uh, pass one another kind of closely, they feel each other. That interaction force is still there but it only becomes important when the molecules are moving slowly enough. So eventually, you cool your steam back down, you slow down all those gas molecules, they begin sticking together, and that's when condensation occurs. And if you continue to cool down your liquid, eventually the molecules lock in place. The interaction forces completely take over, and it freezes back into the solid phase. So I hope that uh, made sense. You know the, the molecular motion is always occurring, okay? And, and as you heat a substance up, you know, molecules uh, just, just uh, uh, begin to move faster and that lets them melt and, and vaporize. And if you cool it back down, it, it condenses and freezes. And we'll talk more about, um, you know, interaction forces in a later chapter and, and also uh, you know, we'll be using temperature throughout the semester. So that's it for chapter one. In our next chapter, we are moving into atoms and elements and the periodic table. So stay tuned for that. Aloha.